And right now, we can really start with our first speaker, who is virtual. She is now in Serbia, in Belgrade, and she is actually from Serbia. She will be Valentina Tsupac, and she will talk about TDD and hexagonal architecture in microservices. But who is she? She is the technical coach and founder at Optivem. She works with engineering leaders to improve quality by coaching development teams in TDD, clean code, and clean architecture. She helps teams strive toward zero defect software and accelerate delivery to release reliable software faster. She works with clients across Europe and North America, focusing on industrial automation, finance, and logistics. Previously, Valentina had extensive hands-on experience in software development as a senior software developer, tech lead, software architect, and solutions architect. She graduated with a dual degree from the University of Sydney, majoring in computer science, advanced mathematics, and finance. So please welcome on stage not only a virtual, but a physical applause, our first speaker, Valentina Tsupac, TDD and hexagonal architecture in microservices. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to be talking about test-driven development and hexagonal architecture in microservices. And to introduce myself, I'm a technical coach, and I help uh, teams to actually adopt test-driven development and hexagonal architecture in practice so that they can increase quality and accelerate delivery. Feel free to contact me uh, via email or feel free to connect with me via social media. So regarding the agenda for today, we will firstly be looking at hexagonal architecture. So how do we design testable microservices? Then we will look at uh, different uh, levels of test automation and especially how it relates to microservices. How do we join these together? So how does test-driven development and microservices work together with hexagonal architecture? And we will also have a practical code demo uh, in Java to see what this uh, looks like. So first of all, a short introduction to hexagonal architecture. What is the motivation behind hexagonal architecture? The main motivation is to uh, develop applications which we can run and test without a UI or without uh, the database. So with no external infrastructure dependencies. The whole uh, point of this is that we can run the application in isolation from the external world and that we can also test the application in isolation from the external world and that it doesn't matter whether some humans will be uh, calling our applications or some programs or automated tests. And you can look more on Alistair's uh, website to find out more. So this is what hexagonal architecture looks like. We have this uh, inner hexagon here marked in green. So we, can, we call that the hexagon or the application core. And then on the left-hand side, these people, they are the users. We can also have scripts. So these are essentially called, uh, these are the primary actors. Then we have the user side adapters and the driver ports. So examples of user side adapters could be the GUI, console, REST API. And then in some way they need to interact with our application. And on the right-hand side, we have server-side ports at the boundary, right-hand side boundary of the application and server-side adapters. And they could uh, connect to these secondary actors, which could include databases, file systems, or any other external web services. Uh, to, found out, to find out more about uh, foundations uh, regarding test-driven development, hex school architecture, and clean architecture, feel free to watch some of the previous meetup videos. So now let's move on to test automation. 
When we're building a microservice system, we typically have a front end, API gateway, microservices, and we may also integrate with some third party systems, for example, PayPal, payment systems, etc. Et and let's look at the different types of testing. So the widest possible test that we can have is an end-to-end -end test, which spans everything from the front end to API gateway, microservices, and third-party systems. But then when we zoom into each microservice individually, this is when we have uh, three levels of, of tests. So let, let's look at this part above. So when we look at the microservice in its entirety, that is known as a component test. Uh, feel free to look at Chris Richardson Microservices Patterns book uh, regarding that uh, term, component testing. And then we have uh, unit tests. They test the core of the microservice, whereas integration testing is about testing adapters of the microservice. And this is the part that's actually related to hexagonal architecture. Uh, this part regarding unit testing and uh, integration testing. Uh, looking at the test uh, pyramid, the point of the unit test, so this is testing the uh, core of a microservice, is to verify the application logic. Whereas integration tests, their purpose is to verify essentially the boundary of the microservice. So for example, integration testing for the REST API, integration testing for databases or connecting to any uh, other microservices or third party systems. And we also have component testing for a microservice, which is sort of like an end-to-end -end test for a microservice because it spans the whole microservice from the rest of the API, spanning the business logic and spanning the database. Lastly, we also have end-to-end -end tests. Um, and these are the kind of tests which may span the front end and all the microservices together as well as the third party systems. So starting with firstly component testing. In the case of uh, component tests, our tests span essentially the whole microservice. So they span the driver adapter, for example, the REST API. They also span the hexagon. So they span the business logic and they also span the driven adapter. For example, the driven adapter for, for the database or for the file system. Now, for further reference, there are two types of component testing. There's in-process uh, component testing and out-of-process component testing, whereby um, the main difference is with the, in the case of in-process component testing, we would not be touching, for example, the real uh, database or real messaging queue, whereas in out-of-process component testing, yes, we would be connecting to the real database and the real messaging queue. But in both of these cases, we do not connect to any other microservices nor third party systems. So other microservices and third party systems are out of bounds in terms of component testing. Then moving on to integration testing, which is targeting infrastructure. And currently we are looking at the left hand side only. So integration testing, we could be doing integration testing for, for example, the REST API, SOAP API, if we're exposing a REST API or SOAP API, or maybe we are exposing a RabbitMQ uh, message consumer. So that is essentially the target of an integration test. And notice here that the application core is mocked out. So we do not test the real business logic at all. Instead, we test the adapter only in, in isolation. And here we can use mocking. We can mock out these driver ports to simulate various uh, scenarios. So for example, maybe the driver port, we could simulate that it successfully executes a certain request, or we could simulate that it uh, throws an exception and that then consequently we expect the REST API to return a certain error code. On the right-hand side, 
we also have integration testing for the driven side. So this is an example of, uh, let's say we have a, a driven port for the repository. So there could be a repository or the repository which has methods add order, get order, etc. And we could have multiple implementations for the repository. We could have a MongoDB repository, we could have a Postgres uh, repository adapter, etc. Uh, in any case, they should all behave the same. So here are these integration tests. We can write them to target the driven port. And then that same test could be executed so that we could verify that all of these different implementations are behaving in the uh, same way. And that even fakes that they are behaving essentially uh, have the same behavior as the real implementations. So that's the integration uh, side. Then we come to unit testing. Now, unit testing, uh, is a whole topic of, of its own. Uh, here I'm illustrating the unit tests which are targeting the driver ports. These driver ports could be, for example, submit order, cancel order, view order, etc. And they test the entire behavior, behavioral outcome. So they span, they can span the whole uh, hexagon except on the right hand side, we will not be connecting to the real database or real messaging queue, but instead using some kind of uh, test doubles. And here, these kind of unit tests that I'm illustrating here, they are known as sociable uh, unit tests. There's also another category unit tests known, known as solitary unit tests, but that's uh, uh, beyond uh, the scope for today. Let's see how we can join all of these topics uh, together. So test-driven development and microservices. So how do we start? When we're given some uh, requirement, maybe we have a user story or whatever else, we need to be thinking about uh, understanding the use cases of the system. So examples of use, use cases could be for an e-commerce system, uh, place an order, cancel an order, approve an order, view order details. So essentially the use cases represent some kind of goals that the user wants to accomplish with the system. Now, in terms of executing the use case, it could be executed by the system itself, or maybe it needs to talk to third party systems. So for example, the use case place order may also need to talk to some payment uh, system. And maybe the use case ship and order may need to talk to some ERP or some warehousing logistics uh, system. And when we're doing this kind of analysis, uh, currently we are not thinking about backend, front end, nothing. We are thinking about the whole system as a black box and how the user is interacting with it and which third party systems we're connecting to. Then we can zoom down uh, into a bit more detail where we look at the distinction between you know, front end and back end and different microservices. And this is where we take our use case and we segment it out. So for the use case, place an order. On the front end, the part of behavior would be, we need to have a screen where the user needs to select some products and click a button, submit an order. The API gateway could be exposing a certain method post orders. And then it could delegate to the different uh, microservices. So we might have uh, some kind of ordering microservice. We may also have some payments microservice and maybe 
also some marketing microservice, which will send some marketing email to the person who has uh, made an order. And some of these microservices may talk to third party systems, for example, some payment uh, system. In any case, here we have now decomposed the use case to see how different microservices are handling parts of the uh, use case. Then uh, after we have this decomposition, we can look at the contracts. And when we're looking at these contracts, we have contract, for example, between front end and, uh, and the API gateway, and also between the API gateway and microservices, and also microservices uh, with the message broker, as well as third party systems. The reason for why we need to have these contracts is because each microservice is developed, should be developed and tested independently of, of each other. So contracts are the only thing that needs to be agreed upon between the teams. When we have these contracts, then we can apply uh, parallel software development. So this microservice is developed in parallel to this microservice, in parallel to this microservice. So the teams are not blocked by each other. No one is waiting for anyone to finish. Instead, they are working in parallel. And each of these teams, so the front end team and the team for each microservice is able to incrementally uh, develop the microservice in parallel. So this means that each of these teams is, let's say this one for this microservice, they are applying TDD and as a result of TDD, they will end up producing unit tests, integration tests, and also component tests uh, done in a TDD way. And now we come to the code demo. So this will be a banking kata which is available on GitHub. So there's the Java version and there's also the .NET version. And I will show that now by sharing my other screen with the banking kata. Okay, great. So now my the code should be visible. This will be a short overview of how hexagonal architecture uh, looks like when, when it's implemented. And here, I'm in one microservice, it's called the banking microservice. And that banking microservice has the core, that's the hexagon in hexagonal architecture, and it has the adapters, the driver adapters and the driven adapters. When we look at the core, it has these ports, which represent a functionality exposed by this microservice. So the banking microservice uh, has functionality, ha exposes use cases, open account use case, deposit funds use case, view account use case, withdraw funds use case. And each of these use cases has a certain request and a certain response. So both the request and response are just plain data structures. So this means when we are opening our bank account, uh, we need to submit our national identity number, first name, last name, and what is our initial balance. And um, as a response, when the open account use case finishes executing, it will return to us the generated account um, number for the bank account that was opened for us. So notice here, we only know the use cases and the input and output for the use case, but we actually currently have no idea what is the implementation of the use case. We will get to that soon. So this is on the left-hand side, uh, the, these are the driver ports. Then we get to the driven ports. So the driven ports represent uh, the external systems that we integrate with. 
So we need some kind of uh, a storage system, for example, bank account storage, or we could call it repository, uh, which enables us to find a bank account, add a bank account, and also to, to, to update a bank account. Then we may also need to integrate with some other microservice, a customer microservice, which provides us information about customers, whether a customer is blacklisted or not. We may also need to publish events to an event bus and integrate with some third party systems, for example, the national identity gateway, which enables us to check uh, whether a certain person with a national identity number exists or, or doesn't exist. And notice that all of these are essentially interfaces and we have no idea what's behind the scenes. So for example, for the storage mechanism, we don't know is it a, a Postgres database or MongoDB or anything else. And for some third party system, national identity gateway, we don't know is that third party system a REST API, SOAP service, or, or anything else. So we've covered up to now the core, the ports, we've seen the adapters, and let's look at also some of the tests. So each of these use cases, so we saw the use cases here, they have a corresponding test. So let's say open account use case has a test, open account use case test. And here we have a certain positive case that given a valid request that we are able to open up a bank account. So here we prepare our request, the expected response, and we are verifying that the use case returns the expected response. We are verifying that a certain expected bank account has been stored in some persistence mechanism and that an event was published. We can also have certain uh, negative uh, scenarios. So for example, if we are working with a non-existent national identity number, then we want to assert that a, a validation exception has been thrown that national identity number is not, not, not existent. So to summarize, we have use cases, we have tests corresponding to the use case, but the last thing which I didn't yet show is what is the implementation of each of these use cases. With hexagonal architecture, uh, the implementation uh, of use case is an implementation detail of the hexagon. It is not exposed uh, externally. Let's look at an example of a CRUD implementation of the open um, account use case. So here we're getting, I mean, from the request, first name, last name, balance. Uh, we may be checking whether the national identity number exists. Is the customer blacklisted or not? and do some additional operations like storing, saving the bank account into the repository. We may also have a more clean architecture style implementation with a rich domain, whereby we have an open account uh, use case, but it is delegating a lot of work to some rich uh, objects like the bank account here. So those are just some possible implementations of how to implement um, a use case. The other thing that I wanted to illustrate, especially with the focus on testing, is the different kinds of tests. So let's say for our storage mechanism or known as the repository, we could have some test cases that if we create a bank account, we should be able to retrieve it. Or if we add multiple bank accounts, that sh we should be able to retrieve all of them. But at this point, uh, this is an interface. So we actually don't know which database is actually behind the scenes. 
And this same test could, can then be executed both for JPA and for MongoDB and for Redis and for anything uh, else, essentially. And the last point that I wanted to illustrate regarding uh, tests. So we've seen the unit tests. These were the unit tests which run purely in memory. So unit tests for the use cases. We've seen the adapter integration uh, tests here, which tests, for example, the repository. And when we look at integration tests, if we're integrating with other, let's say, microservices, we may use contract testing. So this is what a contract test looks like using PACT to test integration with other uh, microservices. So this is basically I guess a very short overview of this project. It is a big one, so feel free to take a look at GitHub. Uh, I will now switch back to the PowerPoint presentation just to finish off. So yes, feel free to look at GitHub to see the whole source code and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or would like to contribute. And to conclude, a hexagonal architecture helps us to develop and test our application in isolation. So we are isolating our application, which contains the business logic. We isolate it away from the external world, such as the presentation mechanisms and uh, persistence mechanisms. Uh, whereas microservice architecture helps us uh, to more effectively implement large and complex applications because we can split them into multiple independently deployable microservices so that each team can have ownership. And as we've seen, we can use both microservice and hexagonal architecture by applying hexagonal arch architecture at the microservice level. And the main uh, Intention behind this is testability. So we get a high level of testability for each microservice, whereby each microservice has its own tests, unit test, integration tests, and component tests, which are executed on its pipeline. And this should be the majority of the tests we have, and only a very few end-to-end -end tests, which span the entire system, so covering all the microservices. And the benefits of all this is higher testability, so lower maintenance costs and essentially higher return on investment. For further references, uh, feel free to look at some of these resources regarding hexagonal architecture and also microservices and how it uh, is all combined together. I would like to say uh, thank you to, to everyone once again. Uh, feel free to reach out to me via email or social media. Uh, so all of these topics that were presented today, it is actually a very common need for various teams that I've helped uh, during coaching. So thanks again. And now I'm open to any questions. Thanks a lot, Valentina, for this great presentation. We have actually also a Slido link which you can see here. So if you have any questions to Valentina, please make a picture from a QR code, get into Slido, ask the question, and then upvote or downvote the question so we can see what to, what to ask from Valentina in the upcoming 10 minutes. OK, can I, did you do that? Can we get back Valentina on screen? If you write slide.do, you can enter. And all the information is actually here in, um, in this ticket. Can I get back the picture, please? No questions yet, yes. So there are no questions yet, but we can start with uh, a few questions of mine. So, Valentina, let's talk about the benefits. Um, what are the benefits of TDD and microservices? What is your take on this question? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that, that's a really good question. So first of all, let's start off with what are the problems faced by companies and then how that relates to the motivation for why uh, we, are, we are doing what we're doing. So one of the biggest problems within enterprise software development is the maintainability of software. So essentially software is uh, too uh, costly to maintain and this is often caused due to two problems. Uh, one of the problems is that the domain became too complex and for example, the team is working in a, multiple teams are working all on a single monolith. The domain is too big, it's too complex. Uh, the second problem is that the team may not have any adequate test automation and may spend a lot of time solving uh, regression bugs. Mm -hmm. And essentially, um, Microservices helps us uh, deal with this case of a very, uh, very big, very complex domain and multiple teams working on it so that instead of all of them working on a monolith, it is simply more effective to split them so that each one takes a certain bounded context and uses that bounded context to essentially to have uh, microservices. And on the other hand, that other problem regarding uh, testing, uh, the fact that regression bugs are a huge issue that can be mitigated by automated tests and test-driven development is the most effective way to get into a reliable test suit. That sounds great. Actually, we are also testing with TDD in, our, in my team, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting as, as a methodology, but you have to nowadays. Okay, the second question would be more about the implementation. So what would be the first thing to do if you want to implement TDD and the microservices into your system? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So the first thing that I would say is firstly not going onto microservices, but rather uh, stabilizing things uh, as is on the monolith, especially discovering the bounded contexts. Uh, what happens is when teams don't yet understand the bounded context splitting, and try to go onto microservices, it will be a disaster. So that's the first point. Do we understand where our bounded contexts are? And then within our monolith, we can uh, transform our monolith into a modular monolith based on the bounded context. And then from the modular monolith, we take its module, each module is a bounded context, and then we can easily make each module a microservice because we already have the logical separation. So that would be the sort of pathway for transitioning from monolith to uh, microservices. Now, the other part, which I would say is actually the more difficult part, which is uh, how do we go to TDD? Especially for a team which currently has uh, no unit tests at all, or the unit tests are badly written uh, anyway. Uh, in that case, I would actually say that going to TDD straight away would be a mistake, like it would result in a uh, complete disaster. Instead, it is more preferable for firstly to, to help the team understand effective test practices in general. So how do you write effective unit tests in a test last approach. And generally, uh, I would say, firstly, starting off with understanding metrics. So what is the meaning of code coverage metric? What is the meaning of mutation testing metric, especially in its relation to uh, are our tests protecting us against regression bugs? How do we write unit tests that are expressing behavior rather than implementation details and practicing that in a test last approach? And when the team has gained those practices in writing effective unit tests and, of course, effective integration tests, etc., then it's, it's actually possible to start thinking about, okay, let's reverse our sequence instead of writing the test last. Let's write our tests first, but that's just one part. And let's also work in an incremental uh, way. All of these things are, well, easier said than done. Uh, I would say it takes at least several months to even achieve foundational levels of this kind of uh, transformation. Okay, so break down the monolith. This is your message. 
towards that into smaller pieces. Okay, I'm looking for the Slido questions, so let's pick one. A lot of things are going back to monoliths due to big overhead in developing microservices, dependencies and ad infra cost. What's your take on that? But it's more like a, a take on the story. So what do you think about that, Valentina? Okay, uh, so I just have issues with seeing the question. If maybe you could be moved the screen more to the right hand side so that I can see the full question, if that's possible, or, or if you could read it out once more. Yes, I can read it out once more. So a lot of teams are going back to monoliths due to big overhead in developing microservices, dependencies, and add infra costs. What's your take on that? Okay, yes, I, I fully agree with that. So. Uh, the problem is, uh, in initial stages, I view microservices as an overhead. Because here's the thing, when you have a monolith, everything is talking to itself in memory. So you may have certain things like ordering, payments, warehousing, and when it's in a monolith, it is all in process, and you can handle it all through, let's say, unit tests, integration tests, etc. Et you don't need pretty much anything else. So it's less effort in tests and uh, essentially le less problems. As soon as you split that physically, which is what happens with microservices, then to get the same level of reliability in terms of testing, you have to use contract testing. So that is, for example, additional work regarding testing. The other also point is um, regarding design. In a monolith, you could have a big ball of mud and still sort of survive. But when you have a big ball of mud translated to microservices, you get microservices which are tightly coupled and you end up with a distributed monolith. So all of the, and this uh, happens quite a lot to teams who went to microservices without uh, having the right bounded context first. Like that's the biggest mistake. And in those cases, uh, microservices are indeed the worst thing possible. And this situation, unfortunately, is quite common. Thanks a lot for your answer.